for this uh, incredible fab panel that we have. And first off, we have Vlad Settler. Vlad, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Nick. Uh, this is a, a wonderful event. Uh, what I've seen so far has just been absolutely amazing. And uh, as you can see, I am dressed for the occasion. Ah, there you go. That's beautiful. I absolutely love it. Uh, Vlad Settler, of course, is an analyst and a co-owner of Elite Fantasy HQ. Vlad's known for a lot of things in this industry, calling out Christian Yelich's MVP season, his incredible fab pieces, and most importantly, being a champion of fantasy analysts, getting their start in the industry. He's won Tout Wars as well as 32 high stakes leagues. You can find him on Twitter at Roto Gut. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, next up, I'm going to bring in Scott Pianowski. How you doing, Scott? I'm doing great, Nick. How are you? Oh, fantastic. I mean, this is just incredible that we're able to do this. This is the third day of four. Um, it's gone so well so far, and uh, the entire community has just been so generous. But you should know Scott Pianowski is a FSWA award-winning writer and host of the award-winning Yahoo Fantasy Baseball podcast. He's also a music expert who enjoys word games and poker. You can find him on Twitter at Scott underscore Pianowski. You ready to talk about some fab today? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, nothing really says um, fab strategy like wearing a, a hat from a defunct hockey team. So uh, I'm <laughs> the Hartford Whalers today. And uh, that's my first tip is, you know, wear some crazy piece of headgear. And that's a, that's like an EV move, a plus EV move. Oh, I love it. Love it. Um, and the last but not least, of course, is Scott Jen said, thanks so much for being here, Scott. Absolutely. Thank Nick. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate the invite. How's everybody? Hey, Scotty. Good. Doing great. Uh, so uh, while Scott is an excellent writer and podcaster for Rotowire, his true talent is his performance in the NFBC, a legend in the industry with five NFBC main, main event titles. There are a few more qualified to discuss fab strategies in the business. You can find him on Twitter at Scott Genstad. Really, thanks so much for being here at PitchCon, guys. Thanks, thanks for having us. I don't have a fab shirt or a whaler shirt, but I got a golf shirt. Does that help? We'll go with that. I'll allow it. Right. <laughs> but anyway, guys, I'm going to let you have the floor here. Uh, let me know if there's anything you want to share along the way. And I'm really enjoying this panel. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. So this is really cool because I'm here with, uh, with, with two guys, uh, both named Scott. Uh, who I've played fantasy with and have known for a really long time. Uh, uh, two guys I've actually looked up to over there. So, so Scott Pianowski, uh, when I first started playing, he was the guy you click on Yahoo, you'd see his rankings, you read his articles. And some of the first fab pieces I ever read were from Scott Pianowski. Uh, Scott Jensen and I have known each other personally for about two decades now. I've actually um, uh, learned a lot of my skills about just in, have improved my game as a fantasy player from Scott. So this is fantastic uh, being being here with both of you guys here today. Yeah, likewise. I've, I've learned a lot from both of you guys. Um, when I didn't have a lot of NFBC experience, you know, Genstad, I was picking his brain constantly. And and, and Vlad, I know that you're um, – so much of what we're going to talk about today I think is related to game theory. I think actually a lot of it can even be related to poker. And, um, you know, I, I think you're putting out some of the best stuff in the business, not just – I mean, it's the whole idea, right? We can give everybody the fish, you know, pick up this guy, pick up that guy. But the real money is knowing what the technique is, what the process is, what will make you a better fab player. And, you know, hopefully we'll get to talk about some of that today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's funny you mentioned NFBC titles and that. Uh, but Vlad, you and I driving to, driving to Vegas in March every year. Uh, there's a, there's no way to underestimate how much that has helped uh, my game. It's that uh, those last four hours that we talk, uh, we talk players, we talk positions, we talk strategy are always really valuable. So I, I always appreciate that, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys had me on. And by the by the way, uh, you know, you hear a lot, and, and I'm I'm just going to force poker references in here as much as I can. <laughs> People will say. If you want to be a better poker player, one thing to do is just to hang around better poker players, talk about hands, talk about tournaments, talk about situations you find yourself in. And that's a great way to improve at anything. You know, if, if you want to be a better tennis player, hang around with other tennis players and talk and play and and you know discuss techniques. I have people I, I pick their brains when I'm I'm trying to get better at golf. You know, I'll talk to people who are better than me about certain things I'm trying. And just I guess the first tip other than anything we talk about today is talk about the people who you respect in your leagues or the people who are in, you, know, you can certainly talk to any of us on Twitter, but talk to the people in your peer group. And that's, I, I would say the first step is, is just the awareness to where am I weak, where this guy seems to be doing something well. He's, he's had good results mm -hmm. the last few years. What can I learn from him? I think that's the first growth. We're all lifetime learners, right? I mean, you never really have this game solved and, 
my first tip to everybody would just be, you know, have a little group of your own, a little text group where you, you pitch off, you know, what did you think of that Colorado rookie or whatever it is. I, mean, I think that's a great way to get a better handle on what this process is all about. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people uh, that are really good at this, uh, they're, they're picking up things from, uh, from their colleagues. They're, you know, stuff that we're reading uh, from, from other analysts, uh, other high stakes players. Uh, and, and it's so important because it's a very humbling uh pastime or, or game that we partake in here. I mean, one year you're just absolutely dominating, just winning all your leagues. And then the next year you get off to a slow start and you're like, ah, oh, it's fine. I win every year. I'm, you know, I'm just, things are going to work out. And then it just ends up being a mediocre season. And so that's a very key point. Like there, there's always an edge to be gained. Um, there's, there's always something that we can do to be better. And I think learning from, uh, from each other, uh, I think is something that's really, really helpful for people to get. And, and also another great area you can take advantage of. Like I know Scott, Genstad is a big Oakland A's fan. So if there's a new player in the A's ecosystem that I don't know a lot about, he probably just knows more about him than I have. Maybe he's seen him live and I haven't seen him play yet or pitch yet or whatever it is. Maybe he's picked up something in a broadcast. So, you know, even when it's not maybe how you're playing the game, just the idea of, you know, have a friend who knows the Rockies better than you do. Have a mm -hmm. friend who knows the Mets better than you do. I mean, I'm not afraid to go. Whenever I need um, Tampa Bay Rays help, I always go to Jason Collette and knock on his door because he follows that team. You know, like he's on the he's a member of the staff for crying out loud. So yeah, you know, I'm not a, I'm not afraid to go to somebody and say, look, I know you, know, Vlad. I know you you follow the Dodgers closer than I do. So if I get in a pinch on a, a piece of Dodger analysis, you're probably the first guy I would I would ask for. You know, some I, usually backstage. You don't want to share that information no. a lot, but you know, don't be afraid to know. You know who who in my peer group knows a certain team better than I do. The only problem is whenever you knock on Colette's door, he's usually at Whataburger, so can't get hold of him. <laughs> and that's perfect. Scott comes to me for A's knowledge, and I go to him for the other twenty-nine teams. So it works out really well. <laughs> it's so not true. But. So, so for the topic uh, at hand today um, is obviously a very, very important part of the overall puzzle uh, as far as just. FAB, and, and most people obviously know what it stands for. FAB itself just stands for uh, Free Agent Acquisition Budget. It's the amount of money. It's the whole process of it, but it's essentially the hundred or the thousand dollars that's allocated for your season to use for bidding and for spending. Um, and then, of course, just the act of, of bidding is, you know, just free agent, free agent bidding, basically. Um, and I, I think as far as I know, most leagues are using them, right? Like there used to be, a, there's still a lot of leagues that are first come first serve in, uh, in football or in, uh, perhaps daily baseball leagues. I, but I think for the most part, you guys use only, uh, fab leagues now at this point, right? Almost exclusively. There are still a couple of first come first serve, but it, it puts a lot more skill into the process. And then it, it takes away from the need to, if you're in a first come first serve league, there's almost like a need to be online or reachable 24 seven because news can break at just about any time. I guess there's maybe three or four dead hours in a day, but for the most part, and the way news is, is transmitted so quickly now, uh, you just, you know, that's where partnering up can really help you. If you're in a first come first serve league, I think it almost behooves you to have a, a co-owner because you're just going to need more coverage. You're going to need more hands on deck, but it's a better, if you're in a league that plays first come first serve, I think you get a better experience and you reward the skill more if you switch to a fab format. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I'm almost exclusively flat, fab. The only first come first serve is actually the run league I'm in that you run, Scott. But it has a fab element in it. I mean, it's a daily moves league. So, uh, but I just I got over the you know having to be online when you know closer A gets hurt with one out in the ninth and you got to pick up the two backups. I just it stopped being fun for me. So I just uh, you know I kind of uh, I keep my fab to the weekend and I kind of don't really pay attention too much to it during the week. And I watch games and I scout and I'm looking to pay attention see what's going on with the news. But um, I just like like to focus it on the on the weekends and kind of keep the the rest of the rest week for enjoying the game rather than kind of breaking stuff down. And that, that ties into one of the things I had, I just put a couple of loose bullet points down because I knew this was going to be kind of a free conversation in a lot of ways. You want to establish a fab routine, you know, whatever, most of us, most of the people who are listening are probably in more than one league. You know, the, the days of being in the one league with your friends and that was it, that that's out the window now because it's so easy to play online and there's so many enticing national contests you might want to get involved in, or maybe you're even a DFS player, whatever it is that you're probably involved in more than one league and you probably have a life. You probably have a job, you know, girlfriend, kids, whatever it is, boyfriend. So you need, I think the importance of, and this is something I'll be honest with you. I wasn't very good at maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I would get to it when I'd get to it. I've gotten to the point now that I have in my phone, uh, the cadence of the week, the calendar, when the bids have to get done. Mm -hmm. And I have a kind of a loose schedule, you know, some days will be different than others. Maybe I'm playing golf on a Sunday or I have something to do around the house that will change my schedule. But for the most part, 
I think establishing a routine for one, you know exactly when the deadlines are and they're in your phone or in a calendar. So there's, there's no guesswork. Nothing catches you by surprise. Mm -hmm. And when you get involved in a routine, it just week after week, you know when you're going to do your work. You know, if you're not bidding till Sunday, I mean, it's perfectly fine to pay attention to what's going on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You should be doing that. I'm not somebody who's ever going to place a bid that early because I, I, I kind of want to measure multiple times and cut once. That's how I do my fab bidding. So uh, my, my first piece of advice here would be, other than the stuff I mentioned earlier about having a network, is get into a routine. Get everything in your calendar so you know. In, and if you know somebody, if you're in a bunch of NFBC leagues, you know, maybe you're gonna you're gonna have I don't know how an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever you think the right amount of time is. More, more. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, if, if it's the whole day, you want to say it's the whole day. Whatever it is, it's gonna be different for everybody. But get into a routine. I, I can't stress that enough. And have all that stuff listed somewhere so it's not you're not guessing oh wait a minute what time was the was the pickups in this because look i'm in leagues they're on all different websites and some websites i know better than others some websites are i think more search friendly or intuitive than others so there's going to be a lot of that merging and it can seem kind of chaotic and so being organized and having a routine i think solves that first problem you know man i'm in so many leagues how am i going to handle that yeah, there's something to be said about uh, being that feeling of under pressure uh, when you've got 45 minutes to go and you're so behind, you still have a couple of teams to do. So preparation, I think, is, is really key. You, re you really nailed it on the head. And the other thing is I see a lot of people out there that are like, oh, it's fab, it's fab. You have to embrace it. If you play fantasy baseball, you have to um, recognize that it is a huge part of the game, a huge part of, of the success. And so it doesn't necessarily mean having to start create, creating lists on Wednesday for the week, but you do need to allocate that time of the day uh, to be able to do it. One of the things that I do or that I would recommend that people do is if you are playing in several leagues and, and this is a time consuming process for you, make sure that you at least uh, have done some work earlier in the day so that when you're up up until that deadline, like for for uh, for Scott and I, a lot of times it's 7 p.m. West uh, Pacific time uh, for all of our NFBC leagues that last hour, I really want to sort of fine tune things. And I'd like to be able to step away and be able to come back and look at my uh, my options on a, on a fresh set of eyes. At that point, you can come back and see, you know, go ahead and grab a drink, uh, you know, some food, hang out with your family, whatever, come back, start working on your bids again. At that point, you'll recognize something that you may not have seen when you were super deep in it at the moment. You're like, oh, wait, why do I have this guy so high? Uh, and many times when you make those adjustments, you notice you're a little bit closer to, to the bid line. Um, or, as far, you know what I mean? You know, that, that's kind of like an editing trick, right? Where if you're working on a really long article and if you write it and try to edit it right after you've written it, you're just going to, your mind is going to see what you think you wrote and you're going to miss a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to take that step back and get removed from it a little bit before you can see the picture more clearly. So I, I think that's a neat trick where you, you actually start the process, but then you, again, maybe get something to eat, go, go for a drive, take a shower, you hit a bucket of golf balls, whatever it is, mm -hmm. just clear your mind a little bit. And it's amazing how often the mind works where sometimes when you stop trying to solve the problem actively, your mind will, it'll just pop in your mind. Oh, okay. This is, this is a solution. I couldn't solve this problem two hours ago, but now that I've stopped trying to think about it, my mind on its own is, you know, come up with a, I think a passable solution. So I think that's a really good idea of how to set up the cadence for your Sunday. And I think that that routine is important. I mean, you mentioned, you know, different leagues, and different deadlines. I do that in football. I actually have a spreadsheet where like, cause every, mm -hmm. every league in football is different. I actually put a little X when I finish a league just so I know, but the baseball thing is weird. I always get people like ask me how much you bid on this player. Like I do three or four things before I even look at the player pool. I think a big part of fab is looking at your own team and looking at the standings before you even get into the players. Cause knowing, you know, what you need, who you have, who you can drop, um, how much you can spend. There's so many things that go into me for fab before I even jump in the player pool. I think a lot of people just click on free agents to start going through and doing stuff. I think that kind of within the routine and process, preparing for what you need and what you need that week kind of keeps you from some dumb bids and, and, and make sure that you don't end up with, you know, a guy on Tuesday, you're like, oh my God, this is a AL guy in the NL and he's a DH and he's not going to be playing this week. I think looking at your team is like the most important first step of fab. I think a lot of people skip that process. Yeah, that's self-scouting process. And to be fair, a lot of the answers are always going to be, it's contextual. It depends you know, what does your team need? Where is your depth? Did you just run into a rash of injuries? Are you unusually strong in a in an area? You're in a league that allows trading or doesn't allow trading. The NFPC, of course, doesn't allow trading. The Yahoo Friends and Family League is a league that does allow trading. So if you're in a position of depth, that can mean two totally different things. And then another just element of fab that I, I really think is important. And again, I'm, I'm going to put the poker chips on the table. Think of what makes a good poker player, okay? 
awareness, an idea of what other people are doing at the table, an understanding of the financial dynamics. Who's got a big stack? Who's got a small stack? Who's mm -hmm. who's desperate? Who who what what are my opponents thinking right now? When the fan process starts, we're all going to get that thousand dollars or whatever the monetary unit that your league decides on. So that everything is the same, just like when a poker tournament starts, you're all getting the the fifty thousand or ten thousand or whatever the chips they throw in front of you. And then that's dynamically changing because you know, somebody wins a big pot, somebody wins, you know, somebody goes bust, um, you know, and people have different, people can go on till people have certain patterns. You'll look every week, try to see, have I, can I discover a pattern? Does, does, do all of Jen stats winning bids end in a nine, for example. I mean, I, I doubt <laughs> that he's, he's got anything like that that we could pick on, but nope. you know, what are, what I always look, you always want to look at what were the winning bids and get as much information as you can and mm -hmm. cross pollinate that. And, you know, a lot of times you'll learn a good pickup by leagues that are parallel in structure. If, if you're in two different mm -hmm. leagues that are basically set up the same and, and one league may – look at who are the free agent differences, how the pools differ in those two leagues. It may help you come up with some good um, plays there. But to me, what makes a good poker play, the selective aggression, mm -hmm. not being married to something. You know, Ace-King is a great hand pre-flop, but after the flop it could be a horrible hand if the wrong cards turn up. You know, I don't want to get married to anybody. I don't care if I love the player. I'm talking about the back of my roster. That is, I don't care if I love my 23rd round pick. If things don't look good for him the first couple of weeks into the season, I have no problem cutting anybody. If you're afraid, if you never make a cut because you're afraid it's going to come back to hurt you, that's like the person who never bluffs in poker. You're playing way too conservatively. So again, think of all the things that you'd want to do if you're a good poker player. Be awareness. Uh, be aware at the table. Alert at the table. Try to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Understand what their objectives are and understand leverage and the dynamic shifting environment of the money because you know again everybody starts even but that's mm -hmm. going to change really soon and if you don't have an understanding of that you're going to really make a lot of non-optimal bids you know this the select uh the the bidding tendencies that you you touched on i think is a is a is a nice point because a lot of us are playing in uh in leagues with the same people every year whether that is you know i mean i think many of the people specifically watching this uh program right now they're not just going into random leagues uh, or perhaps they are but you're, you're you're running into a lot of the same opponents every year and there's a lot of information um and tells uh, basically that you can glean from them and you actually would be surprised how many people act are, are setting their bids at the same dollar amount almost every single time or at least with the same digit at the end or when they do switch it up they're not uh, they, then they continue with that same pattern so trying to identify specific patterns of what people are doing you can almost get a feel for how much someone's going to bid and then like you also mentioned digging in deeper and, and seeing all right there's one closer out there that everybody uh, wants is, is looking to go after how much money does everyone ha else have and you know what is it going to take for me to get this player? Um, you know, digging in deeper into the teams. This is where you need the additional time. How are these other teams doing? Oh, they have three closers. My guess is they'll probably just put it a, a keep them honest bit on there. They're not going to go big for this guy. So a lot of information becomes available to you the more that you start digging in and, uh, and finding out what you're looking for. You also yeah. said a, a magic word there. You said the keep them honest bid, which is one of the most important concepts in in a fab um, strategy. It's sometimes you see a player and you think, okay, you know, th this guy, Jimmy Jones has come out of nowhere. He's, he's tearing it up for the Pirates. I'm just going to make up a guy. Everybody's going to want to bid on this player. I, he doesn't fit my structure. Maybe he doesn't fit my roster. So I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to blow $200 on Jimmy Jones, which I think he'll cost. It's shocking how many times, even in good leagues with, with active owners who bid just about every week, how often you see, oh my God, why did nobody bid on Jimmy Jones? Why did he go to three bucks for three bucks to Genstad? You know, why did there are five teams that need this guy who have the money for this guy? Why did they not bid on him? And you know, maybe they're busy that weekend. You know, maybe, maybe they had, you know, they went on vacation or maybe something's up with their job or their family life. And or maybe they just decided, you know, I don't I don't feel like fabbing this week. You know, some people will do that later in the season when teams fall out of, of the hunt. You'll see a lot of teams just start giving up the fab battle, which is kind of sad to see that. But I mean, everybody's got their own life choices. It's very important that even if a player doesn't maybe fit your salary structure, if you think he has value, if you would take him for a token bid, just don't be afraid to throw that out there because I'm shocked every year how often the keep him honest bid works. And a lot of times I'll see somebody made the keep him honest bid. I didn't even bother to plug it in there. And I'm like, Jesus, if I'd put five bucks in here, I would have won this coveted player. I just assumed. Don't. I guess what I'm trying to say is you want to give your opponents the respect that they're going to bid intelligently, but that doesn't mean they will. And a lot of times they will not bid optimally, whether it's just they didn't get around to doing it or they misjudged the market. 
you'll be surprised how often those keep them honest bids actually win. Yeah, and if you look at like just taking the NFPC main event as an example, you know, they they post the winning bids for all the leagues every week, and your point is dead on. There's there's always weeks where everybody, you know, half the leagues will go over 200 bucks, half the leagues, you know, under 100 bucks, and you get, like you said, a couple bids for three bucks, four bucks. I always, I always throw the token bid in there, even if someone, you know, that we had the Fab of Palooza last year, and, you know, Austin Riley was 300 something bucks in, in some leagues, and even, you know, I think Vlad got in the league for 27 bucks or something like that. It's, it's usually Vlad who ends up getting the good price, but, um, it's, there's always a league where that happens, and it's a really good point. I mean, you all, you feel like ah, I'm just not going to waste my time, but it takes you know four seconds to put that guy at the top of your bid with just a small amount. It's uh, it, you'd be surprised uh, how often those do work. I did want to touch with both of you guys specifically um, about aggressiveness, uh, and especially specifically early on. Um, uh, Pianowski, I, I remember a few years ago, just when I first uh, started writing in the industry, I remember seeing an article specifically from you that really stuck out to me, and it was kind of about that that nuance of, of early of the season and figuring out, you know, you, you've got a lot of people who are just like, you know what, uh, I'm just going to kind of spend my money slowly as I go if something good comes around or I, you know, I drafted this guy in the in the 20th round. He's really important to me. He's going to turn it around at some point. So I guess what is that um, that balance of, of aggress- aggressiveness, especially in that first month of the season? And we could talk about 2020 separately, but like, what are the things that you were looking for to decide on whether, you know, who the person is you're going to drop at what point you're ready to give up on him and how aggressive you'll go as far as spending your, your money early on in the year? Yeah, for mine me, is, it's, mine it's is, about, oh, go ahead. Go, sorry, go ahead. Uh, mine is always team context. I mean, it really depends. I'm I'm one who is not usually super aggressive early on. You won't often see me make a five hundred fifty dollar bid on someone, but uh, you know, if I'm a, am I in a fifteen team or I have one closer, that that's a spot that I will get super aggressive on because I can't I can't win in a contest with overall unless I've got that second closer. So me, it's team context, but I am one who usually saves a little money. I like a lot of thirty and forty dollar bids as opposed to one or two four hundred dollar bids during the course of the year. So I always like to be super active. I'm a big churner and burner. I like to especially the bottom half of my roster. Um, I'm always looking for you know guys that get at bats. So I'm I'm one who likes to uh, likes to bid on a lot of players rather than one or two big ones. But if I'm if I'm in a spot where you know say I, I need stolen bases and a big stolen base guy gets called up, um, I will be aggressive. But it, it, it's pretty rare for me. But it has to be a a, a pretty uh, significant team context a, aspect to it. Yeah, to me, I would I would look at. I think there's another way to def- define aggressive in this conversation, which is I'm looking for plausible upside. And it, when, once I see a player shows plausible upside, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the way a lot of people would play is say, okay this unknown player is, is, is hitting really well for the Padres. He doesn't have much of a track record. He wasn't a prospect before the season. You, you know, he's had a really great 10, 15 games, whatever. I, you know, let, let's come back in, in a month later and see where he's at. Let's not even bid on him now. And, and I think the overall populace of players sees that once, once they see that grain of, of plausible upside, that maybe this player could be good. I don't know that Jose Batista, the year he broke out, that they weren't waiting for a month sample to say, hey, this guy's had a really good week. He actually ended last season really strongly. I'm just going to bank on what if he is good? You know, th- There's a, a chance that I could get lucky here, and if not, I'll, I'll just drop on for somebody else. So to me, aggressive in a sense means I'm going to be willing to bid on somebody without knowing if he's good or not. And hopefully you, know, you get those as the Genstad medium bids in a perfect world, you'd like to not have to throw all your chips in on a lot, on just a few players. You, I hope that over the course of the season or even in a half season, you're going to be bidding on a lot of different guys, and hopefully you'll be getting to players early. You can't be a good fab player without being able to see the dots connecting for somebody. So, okay, th- there's a closer in trouble in, in uh, you know St. Louis. Who's behind him on the depth chart? E- even if somebody's in the rotation right now, could he be a closer? Is there somebody in the minor leagues? You know, if you, you need to be able to be a week or two early on a lot of these things because then you can pay the minimum or very close to the minimum. If you have to wait until it's obvious to everybody, then you have to buy at the high end of the market and you're just not going to be able to take as many chances in, in the fab market because you're going to be paying you know, hundreds of dollars for those guys. So to me, I don't need proof that a player is going to be good before I'm, I'm willing to put him on the back of my roster. As Scott said, we're going to be churning the back of our roster aggressively. You don't give up on your fourth or fifth round pick just because he has a couple of, of bad weeks, whatever, you know, a couple of bad starts. I, I know the cadence of this season will be different because we'll have about half of a season if they actually do get to play. But back of that roster, I'm looking to churn it. And the moment I see plausible upside, I don't need – I'm not going to wait around for proof. I'm not going to – I'm not going to – I'm going to try to be proactive to that, knowing that if it doesn't pan out, I can just cut him for somebody else. 
And with that comes a willingness, like you said, to the back end of the roster. You got to be able to willing, willing to drop guys. I mean, if you, mm-hmm. you know, if someone you draft someone in the twenty seventh round and you you like him, you took him for a reason. You still got to be willing to drop that guy. And sometimes, like you said earlier, you're going to get burned a couple times. But for the most part, those guys in the back end are not going to come back to burn you. And like you said, uh, you know, if you if you don't get burned a couple times, it's be, it's, you're probably not being aggressive enough. And one thing that goes part goes hand in hand with that is study. I mean, actually study who's get, who gets dropped every week because mm-hmm. there's always going to be, just like there will be some odd bids every week, and man, how come nobody bid on this guy? Or how come the bidding wasn't wasn't aggressive on this player I thought was obvious? There are going to be players you're going to be like, wow, he, he dropped him? He's coming back in a week. Or wow, he dropped him? He's you know he's still somebody I like. I, I would have traded for him or whatever. Always monitor the drops. And sometimes w- one of my favorite moves is say you, you need to pick somebody up and you drop somebody you really didn't want to drop. If your league isn't paying attention and if you dropped a player who still has a really high ownership and maybe just nobody noticed you dropped somebody who's like 70% owned or something, maybe you can pick him up for for nothing when you have an open roster spot a week or two later because people don't realize he's on the he's on the waiver wire. So that, that goes for every fantasy league. I mean, you can use that in fantasy hockey, fantasy football. I mean, I, I think you need to be aware of what the player pool is like. And just, again, I'm not saying you have to spend three hours on it, but just – as soon as that that list comes out of the transactions in your league and some of the overall data, and Jeff Erickson does a really good piece on it, and some other people do too, just get a sense of where the market's at, who's been added, who's been dropped. And a lot of times, again, a player will be dropped that you really didn't think should have been dropped by a team, and that creates a buying opportunity the next week. Before I before I leave any league in the NFPC and move to my next league, I click the percentage owned column every single Sunday, and I see if there's somebody. You know, sometimes you sort by at bats, you sort by innings, and you're not going to get the guy who who got hurt and surprisingly dropped. I check that every single time, and about four times a year, I'll find someone that's 93 percent owned that I didn't notice through the first time through because I'm looking for guys who are playing right now. Um, but that's the last thing I do before I leave any league is check that. It, it really pays off. Jed said the, uh, uh, the the March of 2013, we were driving up and <laughs> you were very, very adamant um, that year, I remember, about a, a 30th round pick, Josh yep. Donaldson. I remember. Uh, yep. And I remember I picked him up in the main event in the 29th round. Wow. Got off to the slowest start. That could be, I think, about two weeks. You guys know where this is going. Yeah. Dropped on my roster. I, I tried hard that Sunday to get you keep him. I tried. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, we've all made mistakes. I remember uh, Mike yeah. Morse a couple years prior to that were just the coldest month ever. And then he just went bananas for a few months after. So just as far as um, how you guys are handling uh, deciding on who to drop, sometimes it's a, it's a really tough decision. Um, I'll just kind of kick kick things off with it. Like I want, I think one of the big mistakes people make is when they're adding someone, it's over emphasizing what the person had just done that week. You know, somebody's coming off, uh, uh, you know, they're, 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 eight for 16 for the week with four homers and 10 RBIs. And all of a sudden everybody's rushing to pick them up. I'm looking at things like, uh, are they really worth whatever this new market price that people are going to go after? Everybody's looking for the shiny new toy, especially if they're a young guy. So, you know, is this somebody that is going to be replaced at some point? Um, because, uh, you know, say their, their, their five hitter is injured and coming back off the IL and he's going to be replacing this guy and this guy's going to move back down the order or he's you know heading back to the minor leagues. So I think these are important things that we're looking at on both sides of the coin, um, really going through some sort of mental checklist of your own as far as you know who you're adding and who you're putting in that conditional bid list. And on the other side, who are the guys I'm going to drop? Because oftentimes you're staring at two names. You're like, man, I really don't want to drop this guy. And I know as soon as I do, he's going to go off. And that's what ends up happening a lot of times as well. A couple of things come to mind when you say that. One, I mean, as Wayne Gretzky would say, you, you go to where the puck is going, not where the puck has been. And that's what we're trying to do in FAB. We're trying to skate to where the puck is going to be. And you really want to be comfortable and familiar with the upcoming schedule. And, and in certain situations, a schedule that's two or three weeks ahead, especially as you start to get less and less fat. The, the less FAB leverage you have, the more I think it's important to be able to look ahead anyway, but the less fab leverage you have, the more you may need to be looking two or three weeks ahead because you can't outmuscle anybody for the guys you want. So you may just have to proactively bid on them a week or two ahead of time. One way I break ties for who I'm going to cut. Now, sometimes it's just, just screaming obvious cut. Somebody's got a major injury. He's out for the season. There's, there's no DL spot in the NFBC. So you're cutting him, or you don't have a DL spot in Yahoo, whatever it is. But if you don't, if it comes down to, you need to break a tie. Mm-hmm. fluidity to me is a great way assuming the players are, are similar otherwise the player who can most help me now or 
really close to now is much more important to me than somebody if I if I was you know between two players and one guy was was say on the DL and, and wouldn't play even you know, for a month or so and then maybe he needs to prove it week before I feel comfortable putting him in my lineup. I'm just not going to wait along for for uh, wait around for a guy like that. So a lot of times, how fluid, how how um, liquid, I should say, not fluid, but how liquid he is to being able to help my roster. That's how I look, break a lot of ties when it comes to cutting time. Yeah, and Vlad, you made the point on you know knowing you know if is the, that five hitter coming back. I mean, I see so many times where you know say a shortstop for Cleveland uh, you know has a great week, and you're like, well, Francisco Lazor is coming back in six days, so it's just not worth it. But you know, four four home runs and eight RBIs is much different from a guy who's just filling in or a guy who's like taking that job, and you kind of see it coming, and there's a job opening. And you, Scott mentions you know looking forward ahead of the week. You won't say it, Vlad, so I will. Your article on, on February week is, is a must read, and it breaks down that you know here's a guy who has four games against righties in cores this week, and and the back end of your roster that fifth outfit or that corner for that utility guy, if you can get a guy who's going to play four times in cores or four times against bad pitching in Pittsburgh, whatever it may be, um, your article breaks that down better than anybody else does. And it's kind of built towards the NFPC with the, with the half week. So you can get, uh, you know, if you, maybe your guy doesn't look good for the front half of the week, but you have, you know, say DH in the AL, who's not going to play the back half. You can get someone that has four really good pitching matchups and has, is it playing a nice park? I mean, it just makes such a huge edge, especially in, a league that's going to – these leagues are all competitive. I've had so many leagues that came down to one RBI or one run. People were like, oh, I don't need to make moves this week. It's not that big a deal. When you look back at standings, you know, that that last run that you, you're you pissed off about late September, if you got two more runs in April when you weren't paying as close attention, they mean just as much. And your article on that really breaks it down well. And, and people have got to focus on the fact that grinding in a competitive league, I think, is the most important thing you can do to win a league. Yeah, you said you, – you hit the, the right word there. But I, I totally second how great of a job that, that – um, Vlad does with that fab article. I think I think it's the best in the industry right now that I've seen. And there's so many, there's so many great nuances to it. And you know, the idea of not just the schedule as far as the opponents are, but the handedness, as you mentioned. Yep. And remember, we have to look back to the handedness too. Sometimes somebody will have a big week, but it's like, oh, well, he's a, a lefty masher. They just faced five left-handed pitchers. That you know, now that's going away next week. Again, we yep. want to skate to where the puck's going to be. Um, yeah, th- that's totally agree. You, you hit so many key points there. Um with, I was gonna, uh, with I was gonna say it seemed like a lot of people weren't going to where the puck was going last season specifically. Like we all know, there's no secret to oh these guys are going to Colorado, so we're gonna you know the Mets are going to Colorado. Let's let's just bid all the Mets and just maximize hitting and, and, and do what we can there. But just some of the freebies last year, for example, if you think back to you know to the simple cheat code of all right, who's facing the Orioles this week? Uh, it was just a, a no-brainer. All of their starting pitchers were absolutely horrendous. The bullpen was just, you know, flaming disaster. And it was just a no-brainer. And there was a period of time, if you were to look ahead, where the Yankees had, you know, uh, two series coming or three series in the next three weeks coming up where guys like Giovanni Urshela, Brett Gardner, we're hitting like 400 over that span of time because these guys were putting up double digit runs, the Yankees on, on the Orioles. And so I think that's something important for, for this year. I mean, even whether it's a, this half season or this full season thing is figuring out those, those things early. We may not even know what it is this year. Like for example, for me, I, I want to set a good base with my draft. So hitting wise, I really love, you know, teams are, are hitters in the AL East because I think, you know, the, the the Red Sox without sale are a much worse uh, pitching division. I mean, I got uh, Martin Perez starting, some, some guy I never heard of, Eduardo Rodriguez, their ace. I mean, Tampa is really the only super strong pitching uh, team in that. So you're, you're going to be a lot of opportunities for teams to go off. Maybe that's not the AL East this year. Maybe it's the, the NL Central. But whatever it is, um, especially if these games are more compressed this year and teams are playing more of the same teams, being able to identify where those are, like where are the weak links with the pitching that we can take advantage of. And these bullpens alternate all the time every year too. Like it's not just this bullpen is bad every single year. They, those things change as well. So the, the quicker you can sort of jump on that and also realize, you know, these the starting pitchers are only going four or five, six innings, bullpens in for half this game as well. Where are the bad bullpens? Where can we attack? Almost like a DFS strategy. If that makes right. Sense. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of, when we're looking at fantasy defenses in football and I always make the point that your, your matchup analysis, you're not going to beat the guy by recognizing, Oh, this is the 13th best offense or defense versus the tight end versus the 18th best defense versus, you know, that's not where it matters. It matters on the extremes. Who's really good at, at defense and who's really bad at defense. 
And that's what I care about with the matchups. And, and again, we're going to have to try to get to some of our conclusions on the matchups earlier this year because it's going to be a sprint. It's going to be three months. Yeah, you know, all, all that. It's a it's a marathon, not a sprint stuff. It that doesn't exist this year because three three months is already wiped out. And you know, hopefully they can play something close to a half season. But to me, the matchups are, are going to be. I'm going to look for extremes. Something that's really really good, really really bad. Whether it's personnel, whether it's driven by the park. And also, I just want to give a nod to something. This probably isn't going to matter this year because it sounds like the universal DH is coming for 2020. But another underrated part of FAB, and maybe we'll see it next year, maybe we won't because who knows? Maybe we'll just be DH for the end of time. But if they go back to the uh, DH League, American, no DH in the National League, as I bat my cat away, <laughs> one thing you have to look at every week is, is who's gaining and losing the DH, right? I mean, who is who is the American League player who's going to be in a National League park and now is going to play? That's, that's like, almost like a part of platooning, yep. right? Or, you know, the handedness, right? Is what American League player is now out of commission because of the DH and what National League team where – because remember, in a mixed league, we really want somebody playing six or seven games in a week. We don't want somebody playing two or three games. But when the National League team would go to the DH park or they have the American League games, all of a sudden you'd find another player – who becomes viable. I, I know Vlad's already done some work and we talked about it on my podcast with him and, and I'm sure Scott and Jeff have talked about it on their podcast because of the DH rules seeming to be, it, it, we're headed towards a universal DH this year. That has completely, I think ra radically altered the, the playing landscape of the national league because every team now has one, maybe two extra guys that mm -hmm. went from fringe, not even ownable to maybe you can spot Stoddard or maybe you can even draft them before the league draft is over. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point because I I look at a lot of teams and even in really competitive good leagues, you always see the this guy got stuck using Nelson Cruz on the weekend in Philadelphia or whatever they happen to be, and you're going to get one or two at bats when he pinch hits, and it's just even really good players, it's hard to look ahead. And you, in a league where you make moves once a week, you may not have anybody to fill in, so you got to always look ahead at that. And you mentioned the extremes. I think that's really important on on the pitching side in Fab too, because I think this year especially, um, you know, as we look, we're going to get some really you're going to get some really weak defense or offenses, and you got to look a week ahead on pitching. You know, everybody picks up the two start pitchers, everybody picks up the rookie starter that comes up, but you know, give me that middle of the road starter that next week is facing the Pirates in in mm -hmm. PNC, or give me something like that, whatever offense it may be this year. And Scott's point is really good that you've got to wait probably you know a week or two to really know who those bad offenses are, but you know, getting those getting those starts can be really important in a year in a season where a lot of guys can go three and four innings. You're going to give me guys that can go five or six innings against uh, Pittsburgh or wherever it may be the week offenses this year. Those are going to be really valuable starts. If you can get them a week ahead of time, too, you probably get them really cheap. That, that is, you know, a key. I think I'm going to say it earlier, and I think everybody kind of knows this, but it's worth saying again. If you're going to be a good fat player, you need to be able to, to look ahead. You need to be able to get to things a week or two before other people do for one of two reasons. Either one, because you don't have a lot of money and you can't afford to bid what they may cost in the active week. Or two, because you just want to shave the cost down. You, you want to get those guys for the low investment rather than having to make a medium investment because th in that current week, you, you know, they're going to be people are going to be more aware of it. They're looking ahead at the schedule. A lot of people who do fab articles might be highlighting them. If you look ahead a week or two, man, it's going to help you be a better player anyway, but you're also going to get the name your own price so much more often. Yeah, there's a lot to, to be said about um, that that, that uh, calculated anticipation where uh, instead of jumping in on the market for a closer and being desperate and just having to pay full price, basically, uh, you know, like we were for toilet paper a few weeks ago, instead, you know, you can kind of load up early. So uh, for example, if you don't have those, those closers that you need, maybe there's somebody on your roster that you're able, you're comfortable uh, burning basically in order to maybe take advantage of a situation or get for just a dollar or two, uh, a guy that might be on his way into the role, like you're just starting to see it a little bit. You're seeing the 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 the, the incumbent closer is um, you know lo lower in velocity a tick or two, uh, starting to blow a couple saves. You, you know, see some manager quotes. You know from his history, this manager is somebody that doesn't offer a long leash to their quote. So many things that you can anticipate and sort of like you said, name your price. Get these guys for a couple of bucks. It's not just looking ahead two weeks or who's playing the Orioles or who's going to Coors in two weeks, but the same can be done with closers, anticipating starting pitchers coming up and really saving yourself a lot of money um, for the end of the week, end of the season. I love yeah. that you mentioned the managers too, because understanding every, everybody has tendencies. Everybody has a way they pref they would prefer to play, prefer to manage, prefer to run a team. You know, some managers are, are happy playing young players. Some managers like to play players they're familiar with, like to play veterans. 
Uh, some managers really want a ninth inning push button guy. Another set of managers or teams, organizations might say, no, we're going to play matchups. We, we don't have any problem going to a couple of different guys. And, you know, you know, maybe Tampa Bay wants to have three different guys who, who get about seven to 10 saves in a full season or another team might say, no, no, I want that one button I push and let's get somebody to 30 saves under. And you know, when somebody goes to a new team, a manager, is he going to be favorable to the running game? You know, we, we're getting to a point now where a lot of teams don't want to run anymore. And it's important to identify when we look at when managerial changes have been made, is this guy f- it, okay with running? Is, is he going to tell somebody, you know, I look at somebody like Kevin Biggio in Toronto, who's 14 for 14. I, I'd like to see that the Jays, I know it's not necessarily the optimum play, but I'm trying to get some stolen bases here. I hope they give him the green light. Is, is this going to be an organization that embraces the stolen base, at least for a couple of guys who are really good at it? So just keep in mind that not only are we trying to figure out the players and the situations and all that, but we're really trying to manage and handicap the managers, their tendencies, their techniques. And I try to pay extra special attention to the new managers, guy, whether it's a guy getting his first chance to manage or going to a new team. I'll try to even just to pop in. You know, I, I always get the baseball extra innings package anyway, but if you don't, they will have free previews a couple different times during the season, including usually the first week. Watch like the You'll learn so much watching the late inning of a game. Uh, late innings of a game. You know, who's warming up in the bullpen? You know, who was on? Who was going to get pinch hit for? You know, plays that that that, uh, that happened that didn't count for whatever reason. You know, kind of like in football, you we're always interested in a big play that happened that was wiped out by a penalty. It still may have a context clue that is valuable to us later on uh, when they give out that free preview. I think you should subscribe to a baseball package anyway. I think it's a really good value. But even if it's not in the cards for you, take advantage of the free preview because just by watching, having a game on, you're not even paying full attention to it. Maybe you're, you're playing Scrabble on your computer or you're, you're, you're you know, kind of screwing around on Twitter. You'll be surprised by what you'll learn just by listening to the guys talking about the game who have more information about the situations than you do. Yeah, and to that point, it took like it took like ten days for us to realize that Gabe Kapler was a pain in our ass, and it was really easy. And (laughs) And and we literally got rid of all those Phillies closers that year, and it was like it was so much easier. And I I tell you what, no thanks on the Giants this year because he just is a pain. Is that pushing us to Hector Norris? Hopefully, maybe Joe Girardi. I know look, Mariano Rivera is not walking through that door, but maybe (laughs) Girardi's a guy who wants the big red button to push. I think he does. And I mean, it's, you mentioned watching games and literally there was a night where a guy, he brought in, I forget who Kaplan brought in, but he brought in, get the first two outs. And then he brought in another guy for the last out. You're just like, you know what? I just, there's no point in trying to use fab for this. Trying if you have my, you gotta have a good pitch on a roster, fine, use them. But I, I decided I wasn't fabbing Phillies from that point on. And they had like six different guys that were doing it. But your, your point is right. If you watch a couple ninth innings, of those games, you can really see a, what the announcers say and B how the manager's dealing with it. He cares about saves or not. And some guys do. You got the veteran closer. You want to get him those saves, and they, they'll manage it with the bases loaded and a five-run lead, and all of a sudden you see your guy trotting in for the one-out save. It's way different than managers that won't do that. It's an extra, an extra five or six saves in a year is a huge factor. And so so often it's important to know who was warming up and didn't come in, right? You'll say, yeah, say we don't know sure. who the Giants' closer is. They have a safe situation. It's the bottom of the eighth, and then they blow the game open and score seven sure. runs. Yeah. But we know that, you know, hey, uh, you know, Scott Genstad's uh, nephew, uh, Anthony Genstad was warming up. He was going to come in. Nah, the ninth nasty, inning, you know? nasty splitter. He's right. really yeah, good. Yeah. So, <laughs> it looked really good in the bullpen. Nobody could touch him. They couldn't even catch him. So uh, a lot of times just looking at who's, who's going to come into a safe situation that ultimately doesn't come to fruition. That can, a lot of times that's your pickup because there was the guy who was going to get the save and then they backed off him because the safe situation went away. Jensen, you remember uh, 2017, I think, Tori Lavula, Lavula's uh, <laughs> uh, first year? I, I still uh, give you crap about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was like, I'm digging in. Oh, you know, his entire managerial career in the minors, nobody ever ran on, on any of his teams. I think the Diamondbacks were second in team <laughs> steals that year. It was crazy. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's with those new guys, it's really key to watch those first couple of weeks. And that Scott makes a good point there. So, w- one other thing I want to t- touch on is um, how much are you guys typically saving for, let's say, in a, in a typical season? for that stretch run, the, the final six weeks or September, um, is it important? Do you have like a set number, uh, like 10% of your budget, 20% of your budget, or does that change year to year? And then specifically to 2020, how important is it going to be uh, for uh, considering the season's uh, now the sprint that it is and half the year, how how different is that going to be for you this year as far as your approach to saving money? I defer to Scott on this one. 
All right. My my saving money, I mean, there's there's every year changes. And if you need someone and you have to spend your money, you got to do it. But my goal is 75 bucks on, say, August 20th, say five weeks left. I want to be able to um, I want to be able to get those two start pitches if I need wins. I want to be able to grab some churn and burn hitters if, you know, especially in September, usually a normal season, you get a few more roster spots. It was going to go down this year, but you still get more roster spots. You get the guys that get playing time. I want to be able to win bids in September if I'm competing in a league that I, that I need to. I'm going to want to be able to bid $27 on a guy and win it i hate having six bucks left and you know i got a bit of dollar and every guy i want gets everybody everybody wants the same guys in september it's always the same list all those fabulous are exactly the same at that point you're getting two start pitchers you're getting stars with good matchups um 75 bucks for the last five weeks is usually my ballpark it tends to shift here and there based on a team and what i need but that's usually my uh, that's usually my goal as i go into each season on at least on a on a competitive team where I'm, you know, I need some money at the end. I know people are going to be active in the last month of the season. Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable ballpark. I, I defer to Scott because he just has more NFBC experience than I do. But um, I, I, that sounds about right. You don't want to be, certainly don't want to be out of money. And again, no. you may get, you have to play every situ- every season. It, it's like if I told you guys I was playing in a poker tournament tonight, you could say, well, what's your strategy? What are you doing? What are you doing the fifth hand? I don't, I don't know. I mean, we'll we'll right. see what happens. We'll see what cards I get. We'll see what my needs are at that point. What you know, what what the table looks like and everything. But um, you would like to have some money saved if it comes to a situation you have to spend it earlier. You deal with it. It's just, don't don't run out of money completely. I, injuries are going to come. You're, you're going to that's going to be a crippling thing if you don't have some kind of a slush fund. So I would certainly. I think Scott's target here is reasonable it, it's obviously you know, we're gonna have a different playability in 2020 but you want to have some some leverage where you can win bids and not just one dollar guys and some of that goes to if you have zero dollar bids in your league it's an important mm. league rule structure if you have zero dollar bids and you can pick up guys after the fab period or you pick up guys for a zero that changed a lot in the nfbc if you have zero you're not picking anybody up somebody gets hurt you're not dropping them you have to go with that so zero bids changes that a little bit but in a in a league where i can't bid zero i want 75 bucks maybe a little bit less than a, a zero dollar bid. In, in a football league it's not unusual but my, my cat just won't leave me alone so i'm just gonna say look here's Thomas. <laughs> hey. wants to be on the show he's uh he's a good cat he's not good looking a good cat right now good looking but, cat uh, right there yeah so there you go what'd you That's say like his name what? what'd you say his name was? he was uh, nice. he was a christmas present so he was uh, named after the Run DMC song "Christmas and Hollis." Oh, uh, I thought it was gonna be after Hollis Thompson, the NBA player. If you, if you want to believe that, that, that's fine with me. <laughs> All right, but you know, it's not unusual in a fantasy football league where okay, we have zero bids and we have first come first serve, and somebody looks enormously valuable after week one, then you you could bid very close to your limit, maybe even all of it, and say, well, I'm just gonna get by with zero bids and first come first serve. That would be playable and feasible in some fantasy football league. You would never want to do that in the NFBC. I don't care who it was. I, I don't care if, if if it's a guy you thought was going to be a star. You just can't be locked out of fab for the entire season. Do you, do you guys see if we do get an 80-82 game season this year, do you see just almost all of your leagues more competitive for the entire year just because just from the fact that it's going to be a lot shorter? Are we still going to have people dropping out? Basically, are you competing the entire year for fab bids making – everything harder and then having to actually save more money at the end to compete. I would think there'd be less striation in the standings. It just, is just less time for everybody to separate. I mean, go to an extreme example. What, what if the season was two weeks? No, nobody would have a chance to be out of it in the second right. week unless you had an unbelievably bad week. So, uh, you know, with less time to, for people to kind of sort themselves out, I, I think we're going to have more engagement. Yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned the marathon versus the sprint stuff. I mean, the difference between how people feel about baseball fab after four months is going to be way different than they feel after one month. You're going to have some football people who, you know, that's what they care about and they play baseball for fun and they want to go do their football stuff and that's fine. But I think you get you will get a lot more stuff. You won't go to those the bottom three teams in your league that's been four months. It's you know the start of August and they're so out of it. They're so looking at football. Maybe they start to drop out. Anybody after August 1st is going to be a month of the season. Everybody's still going to be think they're in it. You know, you can be 50 points back and make up after a month and make up ground pretty easily. Um, so I think there'll be less of that. There'll always be some just because football is kind of king when it comes to fantasy. But um, I think you'll get less of it this year with the short season. Although what we might see, and, and look, obviously it's 2020. Everything's fluid. We, we don't really know where, where things are going. We can't even say with certainty there will be a baseball season. We all hope there'll be one. We, we, we hope there'll be a football season. It's possible that the majority of the baseball season may be played concurrently to NBA playoffs and NHL playoffs. And Mm -hmm. we we may have a time, we always think about, you know, we we do this for a living and we play this competitively and we like to think we're plus EV players and everything. But it's tough when September and October kick around if you play multiple sports because they're all starting to collide. 
it sounds like if hopefully, if hopefully we're going to get our, our hands around this thing and you know, I'm not a, a scientist, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I, I don't want to get out over my skis with that, but it is possible that one of the things that may be distracting people in your league, although they don't, they haven't, they haven't had time to fall out of the standings. They're still competitive in your league, but maybe he's trying to win a, a basketball DFS contest, or maybe he's, you know, a, a big uh, Boston Bruins fan and he's grinding the Bruins in the playoffs. I mean, that may be competing for people's attention this summer rather than the baseball having the calendar to itself for the most part. And there, there's no way around it. A Sunday where I'm free with to, to make baseball business in the middle of summer is different than a football Sunday. It just is. I mean, on the West Coast, we've got we got games that start at 10 and they don't finish till 8.30 at night. There's just no way around the fact that I'm watching games. I'm paying attention. I'm watching the Niners at the 1 o'clock game. I'm probably not as locked into free agency as I should be. And I, I try to really focus it. And once the 4 o'clock game ends, you know, I'll shut it down and, and go to baseball. But even for me, who's someone who grinds it out as a big fantasy baseball player, there's just no way around the fact those Sundays are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why, I, again, the calendar is so important. Just to remind myself, have that little bubble come up on my phone. Don't forget your fab bids. And even during the NFL Sundays in September, because I'm in a couple of leagues that have daily transactions, I'll have a little reminder at quarter of one Eastern time. Yeah, hey, check the baseball lineups. Make sure yep. like five of your guys aren't on the bench. Yep. And uh, you know, Yahoo, fortunately, in, in a daily league, you, a lot of times you can just kind of one-click, two-click that stuff, and you don't even have to really grind it so much. It will just put – players who are on the field. There's a little bit of, you have to put a little common sense checkpoint at the end of it, but just a lot of times it's amazing how even good fantasy players are so overwhelmed by football that you lose them in September. So just make sure you're following a good process. And you know, for me, that means a, a calendar and a reminder system. One thing uh, I wanted to touch on is if you will change your, your draft strategy or if you're thinking about fab when you do draft, I, I think in terms of um, it, just something I wrote about it in my most recent article is, uh, you know, for myself, I know that there's certain weaknesses that every year, for whatever reason, I always seem to have an issue with whip. And then I overcompensate sometimes in drafts and, and fab. And so, you know, for, for this season, like, for example, might you move closers up so that you're not spending a big chunk of your fab all season on that? Or is it maybe stolen bases? Are there any categories or uh, positions or things that you feel is a weakness of yours that you might overcompensate at, at the draft? I'm uh, I'm actually going to draft uh, in those mid rounds. I'm going to draft probably an extra couple of offensive players because I think the bottom of rosters going to be a pain in the ass with bigger rosters. I think we might get 35, 40 guys in a roster. I think that finding those offensive guys who play every day is going to be really tough. I think there's going to be a ton of platooning. There's going to be a, and you're going to you're going to have guys on the bench. You just don't want them to sit there for a week. So I think that I think the bottom end or maybe the middle to bottom end of real baseball rosters are going to get a lot more churn and burn than we're used to. So I'm going to I'm going to make sure in those middle rounds I'm going to get a couple extra offensive players uh, with the thought that I want. Want guys that are going to play every day, and I think it's going to be less of those than ever. There's going to be more platooning, more substitutions. I want uh, a couple extra offensive players, so that's kind of how I'm how I'm changing my draft a little bit, knowing that I think they'd be harder to find in Fab this year than normal. I don't know if it's necessarily tied to 2020, but one thing, just you always want to be self scouting yourself. And I know a lot of times I leave a draft without enough power because I'm just so enamored with players who do a little bit of everything. And I think a lot of times Bill James would talk about how the player who's good at a lot of things is often underrated. And the player who's a specialist in maybe one thing can often be overrated. And I think you can get some good values with guys who chip in. You know, Now that the big stolen basic guys are, are almost fading out of the game completely, the idea of, of somebody who steals 10 to 15 bases in a full season that can be pretty valuable. You can tackle that position, that stat category, just by getting some chipping guys and not having to end up with a Malik Smith later. It's always one of my goals. So I'm going to try to be more proactive with the power in the middle rounds. I think some years I've just fallen in love with the the spread spread the category type of player, the, the well-rounded player, to the uh, detriment of my team not having enough power. My general strategy with saves is I like to get really good king of the bees closers i like to get like the b plus closers where kirby yates was last year mm -hmm. somebody who everybody likes but he wasn't at the absolute top top of the market and norris back when i was drafting you know a, a lot of teams back in march and, and even april hector norris was one of those guys who i thought he could maybe be one of the save leaders but mm -hmm. you're not going to have to pay anywhere near that type of price for him that's still where i'm comfortable buying for saves because I, I just hate the downside. Every closer is downside. The closer, the downside is they're not closing anymore. They're pitching lousy and, and there's, you kind of can't drop them. The worst thing you can have in fantasy is a player who you can't trust the play and you can't drop them. I mean, he just sits there and gets in the way of your team. So I don't like buying the top end of the closer market. because There's just too much of a downside to it, but um, I, I like to buy those B plus B closers. The guys who I think have the, they can maybe take that leap into the a group, but right now they're priced into the B group. And, and last year it was Yates. This year, I think it might be Norris. 
Yeah, and my other, my other thing there is I'm pretty much off closers and waiting in the draft this year. I think that, you know, usually you, if a closer waiting comes up, you're like, oh, after six weeks, I really like this guy's going to get the job. He can have it for four months. Now you're hoping to hold a guy for six weeks for six weeks of the job. It just, I don't think it's worth it to draft those guys. Um, I'm going to attack saves in the draft up top. Uh, you know, like I, I like what Scott said with the B guys. I like that group too. And then I'll, I'll figure the rest out in fab. But I, I'm not going to grab that guy and hold him on my bench this year because I just, I don't think the payoff is worth it if he does fall into the job. I think handcuffing in general with, very few exceptions is an overrated fantasy strategy for bullpens and in fantasy football, where a lot of times we overestimate our ability to know who the backup is. Yep. Now maybe in Arizona, I, I might gravitate to chase Edmonds because I think he's the clear backup to Drake. If something happened to Drake, he wasn't very good. Maybe Edmonds is a clear plug and play there. You may see some teams where we really know who the second guy is in a bullpen. If you don't like the first guy, but a lot of times it's, we, we don't know it, it's, it's going to be. And what happens so often when the closer blows up, the manager's going to say, well, we're going to mix and match. We're not going to name a closer, which is usually just code for, we'll give it a few days. And the first guy who gets two saves in a row is the closer. Cause most guys, most managers don't want to manage that way. They want to have the button to push, but they can't commit to anybody. They kind of let it solve itself out on the field. So I, I think we don't, if you want to buy the skills, you know, the old Ron Chandler, you know, don't draft roles, draft skills. If you want to do that with your bullpen scouting, I don't have a problem with that. But just remember, when it comes to saves, the most important thing is is the role. And I think that's even more so this year with the shortened season. I think the role is the role is king before, and I think the role is king plus this year. So we've got a, a few minutes left. Are there any topics that we haven't covered that we can kind of, you know, one thing I, I just thought about was uh, conditional bids. Cause I feel like a, a, a lot of times I have people asking me or playing an NPC for the first time, they don't really understand the process of the bidding and they'll just have kind of different bids spread out and they'll have like 20 different ones and they're not truly utilizing the, the conditional bid function. So is there anything that specifically you guys want to talk about, mention about that? You'd, uh, you'd laugh at me if you saw my conditional bids, how deep they go each week. If I need a position, I need a player, I'm going like 14, 15. Deep. You need, just, you need to make that in. publicly available. You need to think <laughs> the greater good nope. that you're, you're just going to make fantasy baseball will be a better place. <laughs> and uh, you know, Bill James did so much work for free. Just put so much stuff out there. You need to be the Bill James of fab and make if that I, stuff uh, available. If I need a catcher and like I, I'm, I'm paranoid that the first five are going to go. So I, right. put, I put nine on my list just because it takes me an extra – 12 seconds to go click, click, click on guys who are getting at bats. I just, I think just being a little careful with your conditional bids to make sure that you don't take that zero during the week is the biggest thing. You know, everybody's like, oh, I need this guy. I need to fill in first and say, here's my two guys. And like, I see so many things like, I didn't get a first baseman because I, the two guys I've been on got outbid. Like, put six guys in. Just make sure that if you're in a spot where you're not, you need a, you can't take a zero and you need someone, just take the extra 40 seconds and put in four more guys just to make sure that you get someone with a bat. And here, here's another cheat code in, in Tout Wars, which, which we all play in, I think. They show the conditional bids. So say Jenstad needed a catcher and listed 11 catchers he was willing to pick up. You were going to see, okay, he, he picked up this one bum catcher and here's the other 10 catchers that he had on his list. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of times those guys won't be valuable. But in Tout Wars, you can look at all the conditional bids. Now, they don't show up on the NFBC, but they show up on um, in Tout Wars. You can get a lot of intel there for who were the players people were considering who they didn't pick up on. And also keep in mind, okay, now, I play in Tout, I play in NFBC. I, I, I think the Tout Wars bidding comes first. One of the things I'm always going to look at before I finalize my NFBC plan is what happened in Tout? Who was bid yeah. on? Was the bidding more or less spirited than I expected? Do I have any overlap for the owners? Am I playing against Vlad in Tout or in the Rasball Challenge or you know in the in the Justin Mason League, whatever it is? Am I playing in one of those leagues and also in NFBC? Oh, that's like the, the Mason League is actually an NFBC league. But you can learn so much by Cheat, cheat off the earlier fab results and use yep. that, apply that Intel, whatever it may be to the, the leagues that fab later in the, in the evening. Yeah. Two years ago, the Mason TGFBI was on a different site and you had an hour, it was an hour earlier. And, right. and looking at those bids was, was huge, especially I'm in the same league as people and you could tell how aggressive people were being. That was, it's a really good point. Yeah. And, and I think to that point, I think ever, even more than any year ever before, it's very important that you put your team in a position every week to never have to take zeros. Of course, if yep. there's a scenario where, you know, Monday somebody gets hurt, there's nothing you can do about it. That, and this isn't a fab thing, but I think drafting multi-position uh, players as many as you can, uh, I think it's going to be very important this year to really have that roster flexibility. I guess, especially guys that go cross position, like a, uh, you know, corner infield and middle infielder, that yeah. type. Of yeah, the great thing with those players is then when you need to replace a hitter, you're just getting the best hitter you have available. And the, because the positions, I love a team of Legos. Where you have so much position flexibility, you don't. You're just going to be able to fit the position no matter what. You're just taking the best bat available on your bench, or whoever has the best schedule or or makes the most sense. So that, that's yeah, I, I always love 
it, it's more valuable in some leagues than others. We have really low thresholds in Yahoo, so that kind of diminishes their importance because so many guys have it. But I'm always, when in doubt, I'm going to try to have a few of those Swiss Army knives because it, it really does take a, a load off when you get some difficult decisions or, or injuries pile up. Hey, guys. Hey, Nick. Hey, hey. That, was, that was a fantastic panel. I just want to really quickly say thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I, I do have one question. Um, and I was curious from each of you uh, to have an answer here. What would you say is the best fab purchase you've ever made? And what was the worst? Start with Vlad. <laughs> Make me go last, please. I <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go worst for sure. Um, I bid something like 538 bucks on Hector Santiago when he was, I got one save for the White Sox that year and he was going to be the guy. I lost a closer that week and I, I that one worked out really, really badly. Um, the best one would be tough, but I go last year. I picked up uh, Christian Vasquez for a dollar week one. Mm. And in the NFBC in a 15-teamer, when you can get a catcher that's literally slot and play the whole rest of the year, I picked uh, – I, I drafted uh, – I'm going to forget his name – Chance Cisco from Baltimore, mm. and he, he didn't make the team. And I, it was we drafted the week weekend before. By Wednesday, he was in the minors, and I was like, I need a catcher right away. Vasquez happened to be the guy. You know, I liked him, but good lineup, whatever it was. Um, played him for 26 straight weeks, and he was huge for my team. Nice. How about you, Scott? You know, maybe I just have a, they say like cornerbacks in football need to have short memories. Maybe I, <laughs> I'm, I'm just willing to forget all the terrible, I can remember really bad draft picks I've made and maybe bad trades. That one time I gave away Tom Brady. I thought he was done in 2014. That, that didn't look very good, <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember that many of my fab misses. I know they're out there. I'm not afraid to make them. Maybe the point is that there's been so many that have piled up over the season that they've all kind of muddled together. I do know one year in, in NL, tout where any player with a pulse is, is invaluable. I, I pushed all my chips in the year Adrian Gonzalez broke out. So I was early to that. I, I don't know if that was anything particularly skillful. I, I think that the best fab pickups would be those $0 or $1 guys where you're ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I have a bunch of those guys. I'm just not thinking of them right now. But um, again, short memory when it comes to fab. I was going right. to say, say, same thing, short memory here. It's, it's, right. it's basically thinking back. Really? To, I, I fell on the sword and you guys are going to go with short memory. Nice. No, no, no. Uh, Hold on. You want to talk about, I, I mean, I, I told everybody to draft Jake Arrieta the year he won the Cy Young. I, I, nice. um, the, the year George Kittle broke out, I, I said in the magazine, you will, you will regret not drafting George Kittle this year. You want this guy on your team. I've, I've had plenty of those calls. Um, yeah, I, I try not to be a big victory lap guy, but you know, it feels nice <laughs> when you have them. But yeah. again, my thing with Fab would be don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't you know? Don't get married to your the guys at the back of your bench. If you think you see plausible upside on somebody else, I don't care if you didn't like this player a month ago or two weeks ago. Trust the new intel, and and this is going to be a great year, I think, to be aggressive. Nice. I mean, I, I certainly remember like I, I I loved Zach Godley. I was in on I uh, on Aaron Sanchez and Marcus Stroman right after their good seasons because I was back then really into ground ball rates without actually understanding ground ball rates plus high whiff rates is actually what's good. And they certainly weren't doing that. Um, I mean, I'm someone, this was such a great panel for me personally, because I'm not really very experienced with, with, uh, with fab a ton. I don't really play 15 teamers. I don't play NFBC at all. I'm just doing the TGFBI last year. Uh, and uh, of course now tat wars and labor as well. And to hear all your insights were fantastic. I got I think the thing that I appreciate most about you guys is that you you put in the work on Sundays. And for me, I normally start my fantasy weeks I've been doing for ages. It's always been Monday morning. I do everything. I literally missed Fabs last year in TGFBI because I just oh, it was a Sunday night. I'm not I've got I'm not gonna <laughs> do that. No way. And it just passed by. And uh, the, like the fact that you guys are doing this and putting in all that work for all these leagues on Sundays, I think is something that People need to recognize that takes a lot of time to do. And to well, do don't it. don't kid yourself. A big part of that is knowing where the shortcuts are. Is knowing you know who to follow, you know, follow, following picture list and getting the intel from you guys. You know, reading Vlad's article, you know, listen to Scott's podcast. You know, you, that's the best thing you can do is surround yourself with smart people who are going to help you maximize your time investment. Yeah, well, Nick, your your picture article where you just like the quick two sentences on every start is huge every week for me and trying to figure out because I'll see a, I'll see a six inning shutout and you're like normally I'd bid on that guy and then I go read your piece I'm like oh he's off my list so that's a it's a really valuable thing it's like it's my favorite thing on the site for I think sure. that's really right. smart too that we, too long didn't read right I'll, yep. we all need what's the gist I have ten seconds tell me what it is mm. well I appreciate that I hope you guys are okay when I just do an entire joke for those two sec ten <laughs> said <laughs> even better what you wanted even better. <laughs> brevity is a soul of wit there you go 
Uh, well, anyway, really, thank you all so much for being part of this. This was an incredible panel. Um, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to help a good cause here, of course, defeating America. And for just being a part of PitchCon, I hope to be uh, working with you guys again soon. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks, Nick. All right. Take care. All right. So uh, 